What does that sound weird? That's why it sounds weird. Yep, there we go. Uh, yes, I'm heartless. <laughs> oh, somebody what? I see. Yes. I'm killing her.
Jesus family, welcome to our Saturday evening service. We're glad you are joining us live stream and in person. Uh, we are continuing our series um, talking about the gifts that we receive and we open before Christmas. Uh, today we're going to be talking about comfort. And so as I read our call to worship, I'd like to invite you to stand with me. A lot of comforts in this verse, so bear with me. <laughs> Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction, with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. And so we're going to sing together some old tunes that you've probably heard many times and the great rich traditions of singing these Christmas carols together. So join us as we sing.
because of space and time and fashion worlds to his design the one who made angel host revere hung the stars like chandeliers numbered every grain of sand knows the heart of Please be seated. Thank you for being with us for this afternoon worship at Zion Lutheran Church in Fort Myers, Florida. I'm Pastor Hank Simon, leader for this Oasis service. And it's good also to have those of you who are worshiping with us online here today. We're glad you can be part of this celebration of God's comfort as we'll hear later on in our service. If you're viewing online and you'd like to be kept up to date about what is happening here at Oasis, we have a weekly e-blast that is sent out. And to get on that, all you have to do is send a request to info at zionfm.org, 
and you'll be able to see what's happening each Saturday as well as other uh, things that are happening here at Oasis. If you have a prayer request or thanksgiving that you would like us to include in our prayers, uh, please send that to me at pastorhank at zionfm.org and we'll include it in our prayers the next service. For those of you who are, are with us here today in person, uh, there's a sign-in folder on the end of uh, each row of chairs. Uh, if you're with us for the first time, we'd ask that you would please uh, sign in with that information, and if not, just simply write your name in there so that we know that you've been here. Inside that folder are prayer request sheets. They're blue. They look like this. And if you've got a prayer request or Thanksgiving that you would like us to add uh, to our prayers later on in this service, please fill that out and put it in the offering plate when that is passed. Today we welcome back Reverend Dr. Donald Hinchy, Zion's winter pastor, who will be preaching, and Margaret Hinchy, his wife, who will be reading the scriptures. Uh, they helpfully supplement Zion's staff during the season. Our theme for this Advent, the season of preparing for celebrating Jesus' birth at Christmas is open before Christmas. You can see that our Advent wreath here has three candles which have been lit. That shows we're almost at uh, Christmas Eve. And today we're going to focus on the gift of comfort, a present from the Lord that we can open before Christmas. Let's begin that theme with prayer. Stir up our hearts, Lord Jesus, as we prepare to remember your birth. Bless us with comfort that we may have peace in these Advent days, secure in your love. We give thanks that you live and rule with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. One way to summarize the message with which Jesus came to our planet was that he brings God's comfort. 700 years before Jesus' birth, the Old Testament prophet Isaiah promised that Jesus would come to pay for our sins with forgiveness. This promise, or word of the Lord, Isaiah says, endures forever. Listen now to Isaiah's words. From Isaiah chapter 40. Comfort, comfort, my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, and that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling, in the wilderness prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are like grass, and all their faithfulness is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, and the flowers fall, because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, and the flowers fall. But the word of our God endures forever. On Monday, Thursday, in Holy Week, before Jesus is seized and eventually led away to be executed, he assures his disciples that he will not leave them and us to fend by ourselves spiritually. Jesus promises to send another comforter, the Holy Spirit, to be with them after Jesus returns to the Father. From the Gospel of John, the 14th chapter, beginning at verse 15. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter to help you and to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. 
on that day you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. All this I have spoken while still with you, but the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. This is the word of the Lord. Speed to God. Okay. On. Can you hear me online? Okay. Great. Um, this wonderful season, <laughs> this wonderful season of Advent is a gift that the church has. And it's such a contrast to the pre-Christmas preparation that the world, the culture sets before us. I saw a recent TV commercial. It might have been out in Florida too. I don't know. But the, the tagline is, Christmas is what you make it which means spend more money to get more gifts to satisfy yourself and keep the economy rolling along, huh? And that's ultimately the real reason for the season, according to those on that side of the track. But the church for 2,000 years, give or take, has said that Christmas is what God has made of it, not what you make of it. And that happens not in a shopping mall or in your Amazon account, but it happens in a little animal shed in Bethlehem. The merchandising folks, would encourage us to rush out to stores, rush out, get out there quick, because you know, there is a shortage of goods. They're all sitting in a harbor somewhere, and you've got to get just that perfect gift for just that right person. So exhaust yourself, please. And the church says, meanwhile, nah, just take a deep breath, relax, listen to hymns, look at scripture, think of what it means to get ready for the gift that has already come to you. You don't have to fight to get this one says this is a season of high expectations. You must meet others' expectations. That is, you've got to get out there and get them the perfect gift. You've got to throw the perfect party. You have to get everything in your Christmas list, you know. And you have to get your Christmas cards out on time because Christmas comes with expectations. Not quite, the church says. There is expectation, but that's the one that's in the heart of God's people as we wait for the one who satisfies all of our expectations by his coming. Now, look at that contrast. It's stark, isn't it? In a way, the holiday season, that's what it's called, is seen to the world as a kind of oasis, much like this. For just a few weeks, you can stop and relax and do let's pretend. You have Frosty and you have Santa and you have chestnuts on an open fire. Has anyone here ever for a few weeks, you can, you can relax until we get back to the general nastiness that is real life. Or you could consider some of the gifts that God tells you to open before Christmas. And so you, the Saturday Night Oasis folks, have been looking, as I understand, at strength and patience, and tonight at comfort. That beats Santa Claus any day. How fitting that we be gifted with comfort at this time in our culture's history. Comfort, comfort my people, says your Lord, Isaiah 41. Now there are different ways to say that. You know. I think Margaret said it pretty good. But you can say it as a statement of fact. You will have comfort, you know? Or you can say it more intimately. You can say it almost as a whisper. Oh, comfort, comfort my people. You can read it as a command. Or as an announcement, a proclamation, much the same as um, the town crier or 
you know, uh, down south in the courts, when they want to call the court to session, the, the clerk stands and says, Oye, oye, comfort, comfort my people. But that's not really a good comparison because those of you who've been in court, at least in that front bench in court, you know that something could be happening in those moments to come that might not bring you a lot of comfort. But here, in the 40th chapter of the book of Isaiah, these words are meant not to bring indictment, but relief and hope and, you know, comfort. So what is comfort? Comfort is an experience. It's a feeling. It's a sense of peace in and around you. It's knowing that you are safe and secure. Maybe it's knowing that a sinful past has been released and forgiven on a cross. It's knowing that an insecure future is not worth a worry. Comfort is knowing that you are not alone in a cruel world, open to attack and violation. Comfort is peace within and security without. When your world is falling apart, comfort provides that real footing, that oasis, where you can rest and regroup and find your anchor. But we're no strangers to comfort. The idea is with us every day. We speak of comfort food. Hmm. What is your comfort food? How about mac and cheese? That comes to mind. Or, or peanut butter and jelly. Or here's my favorite. And a meatballs. I grew up in an Italian neighborhood. The smell of spaghetti and meatballs on Sunday was so wonderful. Maybe it's followed by a big dish of moose tracks ice cream with fudge sauce. How are we doing, huh? Anyone getting a little hungry? Get some comfort food. At our church, uh, Redeemer Lutheran Church in Fort Collins, Colorado, northern Colorado, we have a comfort dog ministry. These are our comfort dogs. Uh, one is, uh, let's see, Cubby is on this side, Devora, say Hebrew for Deborah, is on the other side. And when they're not patrolling hospital corridors, um, they wander into rooms. They offer themselves for you to, to pet and to snuggle up to. When they're not doing that, they are deployed through a national organization to places of, of, of disasters, floods, fires, school shootings. Covey was most recently uh, deployed with her handler Michigan, where you might remember on June 30th, a 15-year-old student killed four of his classmates, wounded seven. Just by being there in difficult situations, our comfort dogs offer comfort. comfort my people. But here, Isaiah isn't proclaiming that kind of culinary or canine comfort. His is a comfort of a, a deeper, more penetrating nature. Israel, you see, at that time, was emerging from a period of exile in Babylon. In 580 BC, Babylon forces overwhelmed Jerusalem. They destroyed the temple, the visible symbol of God's presence in the land, you might remember. They took the core of Israel's uh, uh, population into exile. They left only the sick, the aged, the most vulnerable. And Jerusalem was in ruins. The prophets, including Isaiah, saw this as God's judgment on Israel for its unfaithfulness to God. The first 39 chapters of the book of Isaiah are an account of the devastation visited upon Jerusalem and the sin that's caused their exile. But then suddenly, you hit chapter 40, and, and you kind of turn a corner. Things change dramatically. A whole new era is being unveiled for Israel. Isaiah proclamation to announce God's mercy, God's restoration, God's comfort. Comfort my people. Now it wasn't as though Jerusalem deserved that, that comforting mercy. I mean, they had sins, you know. They, the rich oppressed the poor. They served other gods. They turned their back on the God of the nation and God's law. And they wantonly ignored the prophet's warnings and calls for repentance. So by the nation came to a crashing halt. Babylonian troops laid waste the city of Jerusalem, and it seemed to be all over. For the next 40 years, they languished, they lamented. One of the saddest songs in the whole Old Testament is Psalm 137, a dirge from those in exile. Listen. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the willows, we hung our harps. 
For there our captors requested a song. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us a song of Zion, Jew. But then in Isaiah 40 comes that cry for comfort. God has a new plan. Comfort, comfort. So again, how is the prophet speaking these words? Statement of fact, you will be comforted. A whispered promise in spite of George Handel's beautiful comfort, comfort ye my people. It comes across stronger. It's announcing, it's almost demanding, demanding comfort on a broken nation. Hear ye, hear ye, you will be comforted. And then the prophet changes tone. No longer harsh and indicting, but speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Cry for her that her warfare is ended, her iniquity is pardoned. She's received from the Lord's hands double for her sin. It's amnesty time in Jerusalem. We're familiar with that practice in our politics, huh? Governors, presidents, they have the right of amnesty. The president, um, usually at the end of his term, has a long list of those in prison who he wishes to pardon, sometimes for good reason, oftentimes for the political payback, but they're free. And here in Isaiah, the whole nation is pardoned. You're all free. Can you imagine general amnesty for all prisoners in our prisons? Kind of makes you shake in fear, doesn't it, huh? But among those liberated, there'd be great joy. Think about it. The parents would see their children. Children, their parents, husbands and wives would be united. Jerusalem, your warfare is over. Your sins are pardoned. Get out of here. You're free indeed. How might you experience those words? Ah, such comfort. This second section of the book of Isaiah has been called the Little Book of comfort. And it's filled with pictures of a God who will not rage at your sin and mine, but a God who understands the weakness of his people and who will stand alongside of us in our confusion and our despair. In chapter 41 of Isaiah, God comes as a comforting parent. I am the Lord your God, he says, who holds your right hand, and I tell you, do not be afraid. I will help you. Ah, get that picture in your mind. God is the comforting parent standing over you, holding your hand, you little child, as you walk along the way. So how does this comforting God speak to us? What does it mean to you to be comforted by the one who created you? Well, I think we all need comfort, don't we? Especially after this year and a half in which we found ourselves cast into such uncertainty because of this insidious, pervasive virus that has claimed, what's the latest statistic, 793,000 deaths in the U.S., 62,000 in Florida alone. Last night we got word that one of my colleagues back in Denver, uh, pastor, um, uh, school principal, uh, succumbed to complications of, of COVID. He's in, what, his early 60s, Margaret Jules was. A rage then comes up about those who accept vaccination as a means of preventing the spread of this disease and others who, for various reasons, insist on their personal freedom to deny vaccination. And just when you thought it was safe to take off that mask, along comes Omicron. Like Israel in Babylon, we too have been exiles in this strange land of coronavirus. And we're awaiting the word of release and the pronouncement by God, oh, comfort my people. And if that's not enough, let's discuss our discomforting political environment. Huh? Such contention, such divisiveness, such anger and discord in the halls of Congress, and then those awful pictures of the January 6th storming of the Capitol, always before us. We are so much like these exiles in Babylon whom Isaiah addresses more so than we can imagine down and out, washed up, exhausted, looking for some sense of meaning and purpose to this coronavirus-battered, politically assaulted culture of ours. There are times when we think that we can get that comfort by ourselves. It can come in some drugs, it can come in a few drinks, it can come in some cheap sex. But when the buzz wears off, when the loved one leaves, there we sit with a headache and a hollow feeling, and nothing has changed. No comfort. Now, Jesus, in that second reading, as he prepared to leave his disciples, he makes them a promise very similar to Isaiah's in 
his little book of comfort. In John's gospel, as Jesus prepares his disciples for his leaving, he tells them, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter, a Holy Spirit, an advocate, a counselor, translation is varied, to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth, he says. Jesus knows that on our own, we will flounder and we will fall in all the wrong places for comfort. So God places the living spirit of, the, of, of God, the Holy Spirit, in our midst and calls it our comforter. The Greek word is so beautiful. It is parakletos, parakletos. Our advocate, our helper, our intercessor, our counselor for comfort. And this is the one that the, the translation literally means that this is the one who literally stands alongside of us. This is your defense attorney as you're standing before the bench. He's going to uphold you. He's going to speak to you because he is your parakletos, the comforter who knows you intimately. He knows your sins and failures, your pride and prejudices and pettiness, your fears, your never-ending worries for the future. But this spirit still stands alongside of us, strengthening us, comforting the need. Notice that Jesus, the Holy Spirit comforter. And he's willing to give everything, to bring that spirit into our midst. Our comfort, our eternal comfort, will come at the cross, in the place of his life on the cross, a most uncomfortable place. Jesus takes all of our discomforts upon himself, and he brings them before the throne of God on the cross. We're perhaps familiar with the seven last words on the cross. We hear them every Lent. I'd like to suggest to you, though, that behind them all, there is an eighth word. As he gives his life, you can almost hear him proclaiming, comfort, comfort my people, says your Lord. In his death, in his resurrection, we find the ultimate comfort, the knowledge that God the Father is walking alongside of us, holding the hand like a parent to a child. And then he looks you in the eye and he says, I love you, I love you. And those who believe in him will not only have everlasting life, but comfort each day as well. We have received from our Lord the gift of comfort. But it's also a gift that we share with others. It's a cry to comfort. You heard that in that reading from 2 Corinthians. Blessed be the God, the, Lord, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God of all comfort, able to comfort others in their pain. The best comforters are the ones who have been comforted. Let's get personal, shall we? There are those in this room who have known the pain of cancer, the uncertainty of cancer. Maybe you've gone through all your treatment and you've survived. Maybe you're still struggling with that awful disease. But to you who have experienced that cancer has been given the gift to comfort other cancer patients. You have been in one particular valley of the shadow of death, and now you're better equipped to walk with others in their valleys. Others of you may have known the pain of divorce. A relationship once filled with love soon became bitter and angry, but there were those who stood alongside of you. You found peace in the words of forgiveness from your Lord Jesus. Such comfort you can give to others who are going through that brokenness. In our own community, uh, grief support groups gather as wounded healers, one to another. Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, Gamblers Anonymous gather weekly to strengthen one another in their pain and struggle. If a particular pain has been yours, then you have a special gift of comfort to those who experience that pain. Name it, share it, share comfort. Within our own congregation, we even have a ministry called Stephen Ministry in, in which we get trained to, to listen well and to uphold others in their pain. Comfort is often wordless. You won't always have the right advice, the perfect Bible verse. You won't always have that platitude as a friend or loved one is hurting or grieving. It, just being there, that's enough. Like Jesus promised Heraclitus, standing alongside, maybe holding a hand, maybe not. Cubby, our comfort dog, 
walks into a hospital's room, snuggles up next to the child's wheelchair, a hand reaches out to pet Cubby, and there is furry comfort. You open an envelope in the mail, and there's a note, a word from an old friend, thinking about you, know you're going through a hard time, you're in my prayers. Ah, there is written comfort. Comfort, comfort, my people, says your God. Is it a statement? Is it a, a whisper, a pronouncement? It's all of those. And it's directed toward you, toward all of us who have known such comfort as is ours from the cross of Jesus Christ. Open the gift. Heed and share. During the next song, we will pass the collection plate to gather offerings and prayer requests. Please also use the sign-in folder if you've not done that yet. We respond to God's word with our song. Our statement of faith is the Apostles' Creed, which will be on the screens. We rise to say it together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated.
In our prayer requests today, we remember Reverend Greg Walton, the president of the Florida Georgia District of Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, who is recovering from a mild case of COVID-19. And then we also have a prayer request here from Linda Woodman for the people of uh, Edwardsville, Illinois, which is uh, a suburb of St. Louis and it's Linda's hometown. You may have heard that uh, the Amazon warehouse there collapsed uh, because of a tornado last, last night. Uh, last report I heard is that two people were killed um, and others who were trapped. So um, Linda asked that we pray for the victims and the rescue workers. Uh, the line of tornadoes that went through the middle section of our country uh, also, of course, hit Kentucky where dozens of people are feared dead. Uh, also a, a nursing home in Arkansas. And so we will uh, lift those people up who are grieving uh, loved ones who have uh, died or who have been injured and which has occurred there. We come before the Lord in prayer. God of comfort, you sent your son Jesus to bind up the brokenhearted and bring peace to the troubled. Draw us together that we comfort one another when that is needed and that we also reach out to the world with your heavenly comfort. Thank you for the blessings which you continue to supply as we prepare during this Advent season to welcome Jesus. Give your spirit that we might enjoy times of refreshing as we hear your word and remember that he is born to be Emmanuel, God with us. Hear our prayers now for your children and for all people according to their needs. We pray for guests in our worship today here at Oasis and tomorrow in the sanctuary. Welcoming Jesus, bless their time with us, that they may rejoice in your presence with them and find comfort where they need it. We pray for those who travel or will travel, Lord God. You are the maker of heaven and earth. As the psalmist writes, in these days, bless our goings out and our comings in. We pray for our country. Lead us to open our ears as well as our hearts to one another. Bless our leaders with humble hearts, listening ears, and servant-like caring for all. Bring us together to seek liberty and justice for all. We pray for individuals who need healing or have other needs, including President Walton, and those persons known individually to us whom we now name silently in our hearts. We ask your presence with all who struggle with addictions and for those in pain or discomfort in body, emotions, or spirit. We thank you for the continuing efforts to contain the coronavirus. Bless those who work to stem the threat of the Omicron variant. Guard those when risking their own health to treat the infected. Holy Spirit, bless their efforts and each effort of ours so that this pandemic may be tamed. Lord of life, we lift up those around the world who feel pain because of violence, warfare, famine, the volcanic eruptions in Indonesia, tornadoes in the middle part of our country, including in Edwardsville, or other causes of suffering. Help us and other followers of Jesus to reach out with comfort as we are able and bless the rescue workers and all others involved in serving those who have been touched by these tragedies. Because you are the Lord of the church, we ask your blessing upon our sisters and brothers in the faith at Fort Myers Foursquare Church, as well as our partner congregation in the Florida Georgia District, Faith Lutheran Church in Clewiston. Guide Zion too as we approach our 50th anniversary, that we may grow in trusting Jesus, in sharing the good news of his coming, in helping others in Jesus' name in this community and beyond, and in supporting and caring for one another as his family. Give us thankful hearts for the little things in life we often take for granted, inclu including solar-powered lights to illuminate Christmas displays at night, the peace shown by a dog lying sleepily in the sun, and the taste of Kringle Danish pastry with a cup of coffee. In this Advent time of waiting, Lord Jesus, because we trust your promises, and because you have taught us, we are bold to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for being here this afternoon during this busy time of the year for in-person worship here at Oasis. And thanks also to those of you who are watching and worshiping with us online. If you're aware of someone that you think might benefit spiritually from being part of uh, this Oasis worship, uh, please let them know about us. Uh, we're here on Saturdays at 5 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall of, of Zion Lutheran Church in Fort Myers. Also, recordings of these services are archived on the Oasis Fort Myers YouTube channel. And you can get to that by going to the website of Zion Lutheran Church Fort Myers, going to then to the Oasis page, and down at the bottom is a link to that YouTube channel. Next Saturday, we conclude our sermon series on Open Before Christmas as we consider a gift of remembering. Now receive the blessing. May God himself, the God of peace, make you perfect and holy and keep you safe and blameless in spirit, soul, and body for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you to stand always. Amen. Go in hope with comfort to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. We rise for our closing song.
shall come to thee, O Israel, shall come to thee, O Israel. 